Okay, it's not letting me do this. Why is it not letting me do this? Come on. Okay, I uploaded the new version. Hopefully I fixed the typos. Did you want me to try and share? Well, I was waiting. Oh, you want me to share? Yeah, it didn't get the new one. Yep, it didn't. We should start. You can tell them the new one did get uploaded. You want to share? I can just keep them. You want me to start it? You want to do it? Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Let's go ahead and get going. Um, welcome to the Skim working group session. Um, next slide. Reminder of the uh, the note well applies here as it always does. Um, and thank you everybody for agreeing to this. And um, go ahead, next slide. If you are in the room, please do remember to scan the QR code to join the on-site tool. That's how we do the uh, attendance of who's in the sessions as well. Um, and please. Also use that to join the queue if you're going to speak up at the mic. Um, that's important to make sure that our remote people also are in the same queue. Uh, if you are on site, that links to the light version of the Meet Echo tools, so you, it won't ask for your camera. And that means we don't get any feedback or anything like that. So please use that. Um, and if you are on your laptop, just make sure you don't turn video on. Uh, and if you are remote, and speaking, please use a headset if possible, and it makes it a lot easier to hear everybody in the room here. Uh, a reminder of the key points of the code of conduct uh, on the screen here, just generally be respectful and um, keep the discussions professional and not uh, not personal. Let me skip that one. That's from the last time. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you, note taker. So Pam offered to take notes. Um, we do need someone who can take notes while Pam is presenting. Oh, Paul is doing that. Great. We're covered with note takers. Um, key thing for the note takers, just make sure any decisions that are uh, decided during the session are captured. The recording is good enough for the detailed discussion notes. Um, OK, so the agenda, we have a packed agenda, uh, the one change that we just made a second ago is actually we're going to start with Elliot 
since Elliot has to be in two places at once. Uh, and then we will go on. So we are going to try to keep this on schedule. Uh, everybody except Elliot has 15 minutes. I will have a timer going on the screen and you should see it on the, um, on the conference monitor in front when you are at the mic here. And that's it. So with that, I guess. Unless anybody else has changes. Unless anybody else has any last minute agenda requests, we're going to go ahead and get started with, uh, with Elliot. Okay. So um, now here's the question: uh, Who shares slides? <laughs> at this point? It doesn't matter. Did you want me to share them, Elliot? Yeah. Could Could you please, Nancy? And then I'll just call out when to change. Okay. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, just a review. This is the skim device schema. Um, and the idea is to do with devices, uh, that which we do with uh, users. Uh, we use the core schema, we use group schema, um, and uh, uh, but just extend to, for devices. That means a, a little bit more than that, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Next slide. Right, so this fits into an entire picture. The green line is what we're doing uh, today. Um, we're actually looking at uh, how we standardize the orange and blue lines uh, working uh, also in the IETF. Um, we'll be talking about more of that in, the, uh, in Prague. Um, the idea basically is to uh, abstract out the different means by which you, um, uh, the different things that you might want to onboard, whether it's a BLE device, a Wi-Fi device, a Zigbee device, who knows, a thread device, um, and uh, to be able to provide the provisioning information for each of those devices. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, core schema, uh, the core device schema uh, just has one or two objects in it. Um, to start with, uh, this is something that I think as, we, as the working group uh, moves on, we'll have to get into. Uh, the BLE extension contains different forms of authentication for BLE, uh, such that the devices can uh, be onboarded either with a pass key um, or with uh, other information, IRKs if they're available uh, for bonding, uh, things like that. Uh, Easy Connect uh, has the DPP QR code components um, in, in the schema. Um, Zigbee is similar to BLE. And then we have endpoint applications, which are a means to uh, authorize uh, communication into the non-IP uh, in, uh, infrastructure. So if you're doing application layer gateway, you need to authorize the application layer gateway endpoints uh, um, or the application endpoints. Next slide. So our status, um, we have updated the uh, endpoint application schema a little bit um, just to make clear, uh, a, a little clearer what's being uh, authorized. At some point, we had the whole entire um, public key of a device in there. We removed that. Uh, it wasn't necessary, and, and, and it's generally not a good idea uh, because you want a certificate. It wasn't just the you know certificates change and public keys change, so you need a naming structure for that. Um, we had a number of issues to address. We, we know we have a number of open issues to address. Uh, we, re we received comments that the introduction could stand a little bit of a cleanup in terms of making the use cases just a little bit clear, clearer. Um, the next two lines are meant to be one line, which is probably a good way of illustrating that we also have some uh, some small errors you know, here and there in the regular expressions for MAC addresses in some places. Uh, it's rather inconsistent. In some cases, we would put a dollar sign at the end of the regular expressions for matching. Um, the other, in other cases, we actually added a dot at the end, which is just wrong. Um, so we have a, a little bit of cleanup to do there. And we have some formatting issues. Um, we do have in the document, um, uh, as, as uh, we, we promised, uh, narrative text, as well as uh, open API and a little bit of JSON example. Um, and, they all, and the JSON in particular has to be folded, and that gets really nasty in an RFC. Um, OK, we want to get some hands on with coding. Uh, we're hoping very much that uh, we'll have OSS code out the door by uh, even before the end of the summer. I'm going to say in just a couple of weeks, we're going to try and get that out the door. 
um, so that people can play. And then we're pondering uh, a hackathon with some key players uh, in Prague. Um, and we'll have more information on that. The working adoption, according to the, the email that was sent by the chair, working adoption uh, had closed, but we are expecting at least one more comment to come through um, in the next uh, couple of days, um, if, if the chairs want to wait for that. Otherwise, uh, we await your answers. We're holding back further changes in the draft until we hear about the call for adoption so that um, we can go through all the changes as, as is. And that's it. Thanks, Elliot. And yeah, sorry, I, I um, the call for adoption is closed. There seemed to be good support. Um, would have liked to have seen more people interested in implementing, but I think you have a few, Elliot, so I'm happy to see that you're, you will be participating in the hackathon. So at some point this week, I will close the adoption and formalize it that the document is being adopted. So um, once you see that, go ahead and submit it as an IETF 00 draft, All right? Okie dokie. So unless there's any more questions or feedback. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is uh, Danny Zollner. Uh, uh, apologies for not actually, you know, providing feedback on the mailing list so far, but uh, my only real concern, which we can, you know, sort of discuss at more detail later, would be the usage of the, of the devices namespace when uh, I guess everything in the draft so far is aligned towards, uh, we'll call them IoT devices, and there may be some other use cases, uh, just what, like uh, actual like laptops, desktops, servers, you, know, you name it, and... Uh, essentially, I guess, consideration of uh, other folks who may also want to use that namespace in any design. Uh, so, Danny, um, I invite you to help us stretch that or constrain it um, as we discuss this in the working group. Like, we can go in one of two directions there. We can stretch it in terms of saying, okay, what is needed for non-IoT issues cases? Uh, and then just include that information, or we can constrain it by simply changing the top level names that we're focusing more on IoT devices. I sort of don't like the, the latter because um, nobody can really define what an IoT device is. <laughs> so um, if we can stretch it, that would be better, but I'm, I'm open to either. If we, if, if we have to go to the latter, we go to the latter. But is that all right with you? Getting a thumbs up. Okay. Great. Good comment. I guess I'll be sharing everybody's slides. I can do it. All right, thanks everyone. And thanks for the accommodation. Thanks. All right, um, next up, Pamela and Paolo. Hello. Oh, that's pretty good. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you, you're willing to? I'm willing to advance the advance slides. slides for you. Okay, great. So uh, we're just, I'm going to do five minutes on just the base concepts, and then uh, Paolo's going to take over and go through some of the use cases we have. Uh, so if you want to jump to our first slide. Um, we ha actually did create a draft <laughs> in the right format. We just didn't submit it quite in time. And so uh, this will be submitted to the data tracker as soon as it opens back up, which I think is pretty soon here. So if you want to take a picture of it and look at it now, you will have to type that in. Oh, all right. Well, we'll just get that done then. OK. Shows what we know. Uh, OK, so basically what we found going through this process um, and what you'll see in the document is there's actually th three main concepts when you boil it all down. Um, the first one is the newest one. So we thought we'd cover that very quickly is this concept of orchestrator roles. So when you think of what Skim is, right? Skim is a server and a client and a RESTful API where you're using HTTP verbs to, um, to push and pull data. But the question becomes, what direction is the data flowing? You can push it, you can pull it. So just being a server or just being a client is not enough information to understand how you are actually moving data around. So, We've come up with this concept of uh, orchestrator roles, which define the flow of data. So if you're a resource creator, for example, 
right? Then you are in some sense on the left-hand side of a diagram, right? And regardless of what skim verb you're using, right? The data is going to flow from a resource creator to another one of these roles, right? So we're describing the data flow separately from, um, from the actual um, restful action that's occurring. And th this is the big thing we need feedback on, we need help with as to whether we're doing this correctly. So we have these three here, a resource creator, which essentially is an originator. So your, your actual object is being created by a resource creator. You may also be authoritative for an attribute, right? We have a resource manager, and that might be something that is sitting in the middle, right? That is, that is both accepting data, but also passing data along, possibly while transforming it in the middle. And a resource subscriber is consuming data, right? So obviously, um, many implementations, you will be playing both roles. Um, but what this gives us is language to say how the data is flowing. So the resource is being created at a certain entity Right? It's flowing to a resource manager, and then it is flowing again to a resource subscriber. Uh, next slide. Um, so we also talk about resource objects and resource attributes. Right, So obviously, a resource type is something that's defined in the skim specifications. Right, So um, a resource object is a thing that is, a re that is typed to a given resource type. Right, And it contains attributes. So that's the easy one. Uh, keep going. So the other two are things that are already in the specification, but we've tried to boil them down. The first is triggers, right? So there, a trigger is essentially the thing that happens that's a moment in time that causes a skim action to be performed, right? So if you, if you open your mobile web app and you change your phone number, that could trigger a skim action, right? A push, for example, of your data to a resource manager because, uh, because you had that application interaction, right? You might have a cron job that's causing synchronization to occur every hour. Um, there might be a single sign-on event where you've actually uh, you know, tried to access a resource and therefore a federated assertion is being sent. So we define what we think are the set of most likely triggers. It's not meant to be um, all-inclusive, but we would like feedback on which, uh, which ones you know, for an implementer would be important for them to understand exist, right? So we think that events can trigger skim actions. Um, as you can see, an administrator action might do it, a user action might do it, single sign-on. So we think those are the big ones. Again, looking for information. Uh, keep going. And then the last one are the skim actions themselves. Now, the reason why there was some, there is some confusion with skim is that um, you can actually uh, be on either, you can s perform either s a server role or a client role, and in that action of, of being a server or a client from an HTTP perspective, right, you can either be pushing or pulling data. And that's the stuff that Paolo is going to talk about, the examples that we talk about. Um, but you literally, as a push, right, you can actually be the recipient of a push, or you can be the cause of a push, right? Um, and the data will either flow to you or from you, depending on which, uh, whether you are the passive endpoint, meaning the skim server, or whether you are the active client, right, the skim client. Um, so we think that those three things, if we can explain them well enough, are going to move us forward in uh, explaining use cases and concepts to users. And I, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask, because I know this isn't the most obvious, um, like it's not a picture, but does that make sense to folks that those are the three things? Okay, great. Any, sh <laughs> okay, I got, the, I got a, a shaking, what do you call that, the so-so hand? Um, all right, well, let's see if we get better when we go through the use cases themselves. So, Paolo, I'll turn it over to you. How do I do on time? About 30 seconds over, not bad. Okay, next slide. So the first one, we are not even sure if we need it, but we put it there because it was in the original RFCs. That is the slash me. So just a question. Anyone did implement the slash me that is defined in the RFCs? No. Does anyone uh, know what is slash me? So it, yeah, it's a mechanism that is defined in the RFCs where someone can get information about the, themselves. We still question if this, there is a need to keep it, and maybe we need to review it, but it's there, so we have to keep it as an example. 
Next slide. Next slide. Oh, too much. Uh, no, no, okay, next one. Yes, this one. Okay, so the next one, this is the typical one, right? You have a resource manager that is also a resource creator, resource updater. Typically, we are talking about an IDM that is going to push or pull, depends on the trigger and depends on the action, to the resource subscribers. Think about it as a SaaS application. And typically, we'll have one IDM that supports multiple SaaS applications. And again, it does not need to be an IDM, right? Because we saw devices also, so it can be anything. That's why we call it resource objects and resource attributes, right? Not users or anything like that. Next slide. Uh, Leif, do you want to jump in about this in particular? Previous. About the previous one. Okay. Yeah, I'm a bit slow. So the, the, the slash me thing was at the time when this was created, people were looking at activity pub, right? And they, they had this at me thing. And it was, it was a design for a completely different, envisioned completely different uh, deployment model for Scheme, right? Which never happened, right? never materialized. I would deprecate it. Yeah, that was our thought. But since it was there, we were not sure if someone implemented it. So it needs to be covered in the use case. OK, uh, Daryl? Daryl Miller, Microsoft. Um, as somebody who spends their day job working on a large API that is centered around a thing called slash me, I wouldn't do it. Okay. <laughs> um, it is a problem when you start to look at cross organizational effort. It, you need a slash users y thing anyway, so you end up with two URIs for the same thing, so caching becomes more of an issue. Um, it, isn't relevant for administrator scenarios because usually administrators aren't working on their own behalf. Um, so I think it has more uh, negatives than it has positives from what I understand for your use cases. Yeah. And maybe there is some application also for the devices. We are not sure yet because we are starting now, right? So we are not sure and that's why we cover it in the use case and yeah. Sorry, Daryl, can you please clarify for me? You said I wouldn't do it, and it wasn't clear if you meant I wouldn't deprecate it or no, I wouldn't sorry. implement it. My apologies. I wouldn't implement it. OK, thank you. OK. Uh, go ahead, Philip. OK, next one. Sorry, uh, we have a, we've got a, uh, we've got a whole queue here. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Philip. Uh, hi. Um, as far as I know, uh, Oracle and a few others, maybe Salesforce, I'd have to check with them. But um, it was heavily requested in the context of OAuth. So the idea is to save the client from having to search for the user first. They just say, I've got this OAuth token or a user M an ID token. And I just, in the context of the current request, I just want the skim resource. So the shortcut is slash me because the authorization header holds the information as to how to locate the resource. And that's why slash me is there. It's a simplifying and it saves a call. Um, yeah, you don't need it, but then you have two calls to make. Uh, also, when the server responds, it is supposed to respond with the true location so that if you're caching, you're caching by the true location, not by slash me. OK, thanks. Okay. Um, go ahead. Uh, Hans Eric Happel, Audrika. Um, I sort of agree with Daryl that uh, it's not such a good idea probably to have two URIs for the same thing. Um, however, I think, I think there is probably two things on the slide here. So there is the slash me thing, but for me, there's also the use case that an individual might want to edit um, his or her own entry, which I think is probably an interesting use case as a self-service um, kind of thing. So we shouldn't probably, if we get rid of the dot me, doesn't necessarily mean we should get rid of the whole use case. That's my point. And again, I think that we could find something in the devices that also need it. So right. we include it anyhow, and uh, except if we duplicate it in the RFC, we'll keep it there, right? OK, we're going to let you move on. Go next one. To... We talked about that. Yep. Next one. OK, so the next one is that now think about that you have that resource manager, the IDM, uh, and you have the SaaS application. And now you'll have an external source, normally, if you think about in the past, something like an LDAP source, or through APIs, you can populate those resource objects in the resource manager. 
and the creation, it's not in the scheme protocol, but it's going to be created. Those objects are going to be created in the resource manager, okay? Next one. So the next one is one that we already debate a couple of times that now think about an HR application, right? The HR application don't want to do any manager, don't want to provide that information to any resource subscriber, but is the source of truth for those resource objects, right? So this will speak scheme to the resource manager and that will provide information to the resource subscribers. Next one. Now you mix that with the ERC, the external resource creators that can also bring information and it's the responsibility of the resource manager that can also create those objects to consolidate that and have the business logic to create the different resource objects and to push them to the different subscribers. Next one. Now, think about the SaaS application. So we have many use cases where that SaaS application sometimes is in charge for specific resource attributes for a resource object, okay? So they are just going to create attributes. They will not create the full record or they might even create the full record, but they are not the authority for everything. So they just provide an attribute. And we have been debating a lot or now the HR applications are providing that information to the, um, all the resource subscribers, the as applications provide that information back to the resource manager, okay? And that is a use case that we need to discuss and there is a couple of methods to implement that. Next one. So now the next one is that think about the, the HR application that now wants to subscribe to that attribute that was created in the SaaS application, right? So think about a telephony number was created in the SaaS application that was pushed to the resource manager that now that HR application also needs that, right? So this starts to get a little bit more complex. And in the next one, it's the last uh, use case that we can see that now think about that in many times we have very complex environments in our uh, in our implementations where resource managers talk to themselves right think about an azure that talks to an octa or talks to a google or something like that and they need to consolidate all that information now these are the use cases and what pamela was showing you is that how does the data can flow through the push or the pull and how does it trigger so we are not prescribing that we just need to describe the use case and try to figure it out if this is possible and what recommendations we are going to give for each one of them another part of the document that i think it's very important is based on that active pull or active push or now we are going to describe the basic mechanisms for those connections that are always client to server based on all these use cases. So I don't know if we cover all the use cases, to be honest, if there are use cases that you think that are missing based on this concept of this orchestration roles that we define, or if there are other orchestration roles that you think that are missing. We really appreciate the feedback. We create this basic skeleton to uh, uh, consolidate the ideas and to join the ideas and to try to uh, allow us to have use cases that are more meaningful than what we have today in the 7642. Any feedback? Yeah, we're a little over time, so unless there's any thoughts, we will. Well, thank you. I think that was that was great. Um, so while while we're bringing up the next presenter, it'd be good for Pam and Paolo for you to submit it in the data tracker, post it to the Skim Working Group, and it would be great to get feedback on the draft so that we can do the call for adoption. So we'll have it there for one second. <clears throat> Sounds great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Who is presenting this one? Cursor pagination update. Both of you, great. Uh, here. 
Um, okay, yeah, this is uh, Danny. Uh, I guess I'm presenting this one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, yeah, I guess the, the current state of things, we've, uh, I don't know, for the past, what, four, five, six, however many ITF sessions we've talked about pagination at some level. Uh, there were various things proposed around uh, I don't know, requirements for the data and uh, how, how it's returned. Uh, and there was some, I guess, uh, disagreements on those. Essentially, what, what where we've landed on, at least, is proposing that uh, the draft essentially remains how it's been written since 2017 and uh, describes the over-the-wire mechanism, you know, the, the protocol elements of, uh, of how to paginate a set of resources uh, without defining uh, any strict requirements uh, as far as we'll say the consistency of the data, you know, any, any of those traits. Um, that is to be inclusive of, uh, you know, use cases that have not, uh, it, it, it's a little hard to, you know, please everybody and make everybody happy at the same time. Uh, and then if there are specific use cases that need, you know, X, Y, and Z, uh, those can potentially be uh, established via a BCP or, you know, a profile or something defining those separately. Uh, so we've published a couple of new versions since Yokohama, uh, relatively minor edits. Uh, most were in response to a uh, review from uh, HTTP DIR. Uh, and at this point, we're thinking it's about time to uh, start working group last call. So the main question is really just, uh, does anybody think otherwise? That would have on the mailing list. It, yeah, you should note it in the notes. Uh, in, in the absence of any, uh, I guess, feedback at this point. Yeah, so what we can do is we can issue a working group last call. Um, I'm looking at Roman at, as RAD. I can also ask for a sector review early. I don't know. I don't think there's anything specific from a security perspective. But. Yeah, hi, this is Rami. I'm just yeah. kind of, I'm looking at you confused only because it seems like the normal processes apply. I mean, if you think yeah. it will accelerate things, you could ask for a sector review, certainly. Okay, so we can do that. Okay, uh, I believe this is our only slide because we're expecting to you know, have people with uh, comments or concerns or whatever, so cool. That's good, thanks. Yeah. I think it's us for the next two, so. Oh, great, okay. <laughs> well, good, we uh, made some time back on that. Group membership. Okay, it's, uh, no, it's me again, uh, Danny. Uh, next one, we'll tag team. Uh, next slide, please, okay, cool. Uh, so I was originally actually going to call this group membership pagination, uh, but just upon thinking of a couple of the different uh, topics that we're sort of trying to piece together about, you know, change detection and pagination. Uh, there's actually a little bit of both of those uh, as far as group memberships go. So just a quick run through the current problem for uh, anyone who's uh, not had to suffer from it. Uh, right now, group memberships represented by multi-valued attributes. They can uh, have potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of values in some cases. Uh, that's incredibly unwieldy. Uh, and unfortunately, pagination in Scheme today only applies to responses that contain multiple resources. And there is not uh, a mechanism that is uh, you know, adopted and standardized, at least, uh, to paginate uh, parts of a single resource, such as you know, multiple values of an attribute. Uh, that potentially large size of groups, uh, combined with the inability to paginate them, uh, has made large membership impractical to the point where uh, just certain approaches, certain use cases uh, cannot be done. Uh, really anything consuming group membership for, for like a million member groups uh, in a distributed system, at least, uh, acting as a client can't happen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, okay, yeah, I got a little ahead of myself, but uh, yeah, two problems is pagination and tracking membership changes. So, to the other part, uh, because if some sort of, uh, we'll call it, you know, change section, delta query, whatever mechanism 
uh, ends up coming into the, the skim spec, then we still have the problem of uh, assuming that we go to the model of, uh, you know, tell me all of the objects that have changed since a certain point uh, and don't try to, you know, write the standard in such a way that you can say, uh, you know, tell me all the objects where a specific attribute has changed or, you know, something like that. that I don't even know that solves this one. But uh, hearing back from, you know, the skim server, uh, yes, this group has changed. Uh, and not knowing what changed and just having to look at the million members or whatever it is and do the diff yourself doesn't really help. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we've been you know, thinking about some different solutions. Uh, Phil Hunt authored a draft a few years ago on uh, a, I guess you consider a protocol extension to uh, introduce pagination for all multivalued attributes. Uh, there's also a couple of other models that uh, or maybe take inspiration from other non skim APIs. Uh, so there's uh, just a, a new you know, schema extension. I guess not even a schema extension. It would technically be a new resource type defined in the stack plus a schema, uh, say slash group members, where it is specifically written to solve the problem of group memberships and leaves any other large multi value attribute uh, problems you know, dangling in the wind. Uh, or if we're already going to start you know, solving down that road, uh, maybe we're most of the way towards uh, solving it for all multivalued attributes. And that brings us to the third option of some uh, mechanism, at least, to uh, represent multivalued attributes uh, as a, like, we'll call it a sub-resource. And in that way, uh, whatever existing pagination models uh, exist in the SCIM standard uh, can be applied in the same way. Uh, versus the uh, approach taken in Phil's draft of a new protocol, uh, or like uh, essentially a new uh, syntax, or like a new, a new structure compared to paginating uh, other, uh, you know, uh, responsive resources. Um, so from an implementation point of view, right? If this is a just about group memberships, I'm wondering how much, how hard it would be to just Sort of flip the relationship around and have a member of attributes on the users instead and and I have that um, be what you implement instead of pagination um, it makes detection change detection a lot easier for instance right um, because typically groups um, it's a for at least for the systems that I've seen um, in our my day job the like the, what we typically see is that we get a, about as many groups as as users in a in large scale um, collaborative platforms. Um, so you have lots and lots of groups with very very small number of members, and it's definitely more efficient to represent group memberships on the user object instead of as a group object. Now I understand that there are could be process reason good reasons to have like both. Right, but if we're talking about something that is specific <laughs> to groups, maybe it's just simpler to to implement that than instead of pagination. So forth. Yeah, um, th that's something that's been discussed on the mailing list before. Uh, it's not a not a bad option. Uh, the one of the flaws that I see in it, at least, which it does have workarounds, would be uh, that. Every so uh, we're, we uh, that, that sort of operates in the model that users and groups are, I guess, the main resource types that uh, exist in Skim. Uh, we just had uh, Elliot present uh, talking about devices, uh, there's other things that may come down the you know the pipe at some point. Plus anything that people extend themselves uh, with the extensibility of the standard, uh, and you'd have to, I guess, do a query at the root of the. Um, of the directory rather than on like slash users. It's uh, achievable, but yeah. Phil? Uh, yeah, I just had the question, have you considered using the groups attribute of the user resource for some of these cases? So you look uh, at a user resource and it tells you what groups they're a member in. That's what I just said, Phil. I, I would may, maybe argue that like, a complexity like this comes at a cost 
and uh, like pagination and attribute pagination, attribute value pagination comes at a cost. And maybe um, it's worth thinking about whether there are actually use cases other than for very, very large lists other than group memberships. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, that, that's part of why the middle you know, option of just solve group memberships uh, seems not the best, I guess, future looking one. Uh, but part of it is that we don't necessarily uh, know what other use cases are. Like groups are it today, but. Yeah, go ahead, Phil. Phil, are you on mute? I already done. I'm done. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, anyways, we'll uh, send a mail to the um, to the mailing list on this one. Or you know, matter what, we'll just write something and get feedback, and we're you know we change it uh, one or the other. But uh, if anybody has uh, anybody else, I guess has any uh, feedback on the topic, uh, either here or online, feel free to reach out. Uh, do we have any more slides? Uh, no. 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 Um, okay, that is then the end of this topic. Hello, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Anjali. So, uh, yeah, okay. So we are working on um, uh, this new introducing this new topic of change detection. Uh, next slide, please. So what we are trying to solve is provide a scalable and highly accurate method of change detection that allows a skim client to retrieve current state of all resources that have changed prior to a certain point uh, in order to perform a recurring interval, recurring uh, retrieval of data. So there are various use cases, not uh, constrained to the two mentioned on the slide, where this might be useful is one is building a reconciliation system. So today in an, uh, um, most probable solutions, there is an identity manager who is pushing data into a skim server, but there may be some uh, bugs or unidentified areas because of which some provisioning uh, the the two systems get out of sync and uh, customers don't have today uh, any mechanism to build these uh, reconciliation systems apart from doing a full scan which becomes quite expensive if the directories are huge so this is an attempt to provide a mechanism where the system scan uh, the skim api can provide a mechanism to provide changes using a get URL, uh, which can be run uh, based on a trigger or a certain interval of time and retrieve changes. And uh, the systems, two systems can scan the data and find differences and uh, do a redrive or reconciliation, either provisioning those uh, discrepancies or even identifying the root cause and maybe fixing those issues. Other uh, use case can be an incremental synchronization where clients pull data from the server. This could be an identity manager pulling data from an HR system and then publishing to a SaaS provider. Next slide, please. So typically from a requirements perspective, what does this de change detection query need to resolve is provide resources modified since a specific point returned by a query. It should return current state of the record. Uh, we're not looking into a snapshot of data because our aim is to reconcile to the latest values. Able to convey that a previously existing resource was deleted since the specific point in time. So today, uh, Scheme Server can only respond to data that exists in their system. But in order to build this kind of query mechanism, deleted records are also required. So there might be a need for uh, keeping some um, metadata information about deleted records for a certain interval of time to be returned as part of this query. Able to convey changes on group memberships, and this is how uh, it's linked to having a sub resource for group memberships so that it is easier to return the membership changes, what has been deleted, what has been added, and what has been updated. 
and the next requirement is that it should perform on a large scale of data with high frequency data updates. Yep. Next slide, please. So there are uh, typically two approaches which can be taken and we present both of them uh, in this um, uh, presentation to just bring out that there might be some existing implementations that may already be doing. So in case of approach one, it is a simple change detection using timestamp based filter. So in this approach as a first step, the client starts with a full retrieval of uh, data. So it does a full scan, uh, aligns it, uh, make sure that everything is in sync. And then at a certain interval of time or through a trigger, it runs a query to the server, which is including a filter based on a last modified date, which includes when was my full sync done and give me records that, was, that has changed uh, from the last sync time to now and uh, give me all the records. So this can be done today by existing scheme protocol. There's no extension needed. However, this query does not return deleted records. So the third point em emphasizes that we may need to include a new parameter, include deleted, which allows the scheme service providers to uh, return deleted records as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so why we are in um, uh, benefits of this approach is it's simple to implement. Uh, it's built on an underlying search framework that the scheme service providers may already have. There may be some existing implementations that are already doing this, uh, maybe pulling records from the HR system or some other service providers to build this reconciliation mechanism, which is based on timestamps. But of course, because scheme uh, protocol today does not allow for returning deleted records. Those would requ still require to do a full scan to uh, come up with the deleted uh, right, or to sync the deleted records as well. So we want to keep this approach uh, in discussion because uh, because it is maybe it's built on top of an existing protocol. There might be implementations, and we just do an extension to include deleted records. However, this solution uh, may have uh, issues with time drift, and that's a known uh, issue. And this can be uh, um, mitigated by having some overlaps while you're doing a data sync interval. Uh, but in high volume uh, updates and large uh, uh, directories, this might become a challenge. So we propose another approach as well in this document. And we want to get feedback from this uh, uh, group on should we keep both approaches? Should we talk about both approaches or should we allow to one? And how do we handle if there are existing implementations built on top of the time-based? Okay. Uh, and uh, hi, this is uh, Danny. I'll discuss this part. Uh, so the second approach uh, would be change detection using, uh, we'll call it a watermark based approach. Uh, with a watermark, you, we can define it as a, an opaque artifact generated by the skim server, uh, provides a point of reference value that can be used to identify the resources created, updated, or deleted after the point uh, represented by the value. Uh, flow is fairly similar, uh, you know, I guess, uh, in order of operations to the prior one. Uh, you start with a full retrieval of the data, either, you know, unfiltered or, you know, with some filter, you know, get users where department equals sales, and then you'll roll that in forever. The uh, highlighted delta query equals true parameter. Uh, it essentially is just a Boolean to say, uh, I would like to have uh, a watermark returned to me with this request, so that in the future I can uh, request only things that have been uh, modified since this point. Uh, names are all placeholders, of course. Uh, and then on subsequent requests, uh, you would both say, continue to give me a new watermark. Uh, and also, here is my watermark, or the, the Delta token, to start uh, you know, just incrementally and uh, let the server t uh, provide the uh, in-scope uh, results. As a clarifying question, so the, the idea here is that the uh, the Delta token is mine. It's an association between the client and the skim server. Um, 
I, I or is it a it's a global one? It's a, is it more like a git commit, or is it more like a a, a, a cookie? Um, probably closer to a cookie. Uh, I'm I'm not terribly skilled with Git, so I uh, it's hard for me to do the comparison. I mean, is, yeah. is it is it global? Would, would two clients get the same Delta token for the same state? Uh, I, yeah. I I believe yes. It, 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 some you said no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I I believe uh, probably yes. It sort of depends because like, the opaque value how it's being generated. Um, I honestly hadn't thought too deep into that side of things. Danny, uh, would you say that it could be implementation specific and it's uh, not relevant to the spec? I mean, it 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 goes to implementation cost, I guess. So so if the question is. Which of these two approaches is a, is like the the the, mo the more reasonable one, right? One of those one of the things to think about is how to how hard it is is it to implement this, right? And it, there's a big difference between having client specific state. Um, my 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 comment was uh, that it is up to you to decide whether to do it when you're implementing it because it doesn't matter to this protocol which of those options you choose that was my question. if that's the right that's a relevant uh, if that's true then i i i at uh i don't think at any previous point the thought had crossed my mind of uh the watermark being client specific uh i haven't uh sort of identified or seen uh anything that it could be oh i mean it mm -hmm. could matter i mean if, can i give it to somebody else mm -hmm. and say here go you know, go query the skim server for anything between that state and now. And, you know, so it, I actually changed my mind. I actually did, does matter for the protocol, whether it's client specific or not. Uh, you're, the, you're not intending this to be passed to anybody else, correct? Uh, I, I guess when you say anybody else, uh, if a client holds on to the token and uses it in further requests, and that's the scope of what you're proposing? That is, uh, I, I think, what would be with any intended use case that I've envisioned. I, I guess also defining is the client sort of the actor, you know, the person or organization or whatever, or the specific application. Uh, but uh, it's, it's something that I don't, uh, I, I, it hasn't been honestly considered enough to give you an answer one way or the other. Okay, Mike is on the queue. Yeah. Uh, uh, there we go. You got me? Okay. Sorry. Um, Danny, you knew I was coming. A um, couple, couple thoughts. Um, one, we've done both of this uh, at SailPoint, and um, we've implemented both of these in different kind of formats. So a couple thoughts. One, I think you're right to comment that a full ag or a full sync is the starting point for all of this. We find that in doing these kind of delta aggregations, historically, a full aggregation is also super helpful for a Sandy check um, because things things tend to get a little out of whack for various reasons. And we can talk more detail offline, you know, about why those exactly happen. But sometimes full sync is just required, right? So uh, we do, you know, there, there's time change. Timestamp seems easiest to me on the outset. In other words, more common that, yeah, I can do a timestamp on that instance of that service provider, uh, whatever, I can't remember what Pam and, and Paula were calling it, but I like that name better. Basically, the, the, you know, the real repository of information. And then I hand that back um, as, as, a, as a timestamp on the target system rather than arguing about who the timestamp is, right? Um, other times when the timestamp isn't used, we can we do kind of what you're doing with a token approach where we say, look, we're gonna collect information from this system. It's gonna hand back a token that it understands and we'll save off that token and we'll we'll do a time, we'll keep time on our own side to say this token is gonna be valid for this number of days or this number of hours. And then we'll go back out and re-ask for the next aggregation, the next delta aggregation kind of a vibe. So part of it is is kind of, I think I mean at this point, at subsequent to later discussion, I'm kind of in favor of both. Just to think some, for some systems, it's going to be easier to do timestamps. Some systems, it's going to be easier to, it, a little more sophisticated to have token generation. Another open question I have as a comment, and then I'll be quiet, um, is how common or how easy is it for systems to have a, 
a, a, a soft delete or a staging area of deletions, if you're making is deleted a requirement, how much of a, a burden is that uh, on these target systems to provide that back in? I don't know. I know that in the wild, there's not a lot of systems that hand back an is deleted kind of vibe, um, but I'm, I'm open to that idea. I'll be quiet now. Thanks, Pam. Hi, Pam Dingle. Uh, I think with respect to the question of client-specific uh, Delta tokens, uh, you know, I th the follow-on to that is, does possession of the Delta token convey any kind of access, right? I, like, I think that has to be either way, it should get written into the considerations. Um, I would s suspect that we would want to ch make that choice and make it part of the spec rather than having that question of whether it conveys access to be um, an implementation detail. Um, yeah, and I would, uh, uh, if, if I was uh, writing anything, at least I wouldn't uh, want the token to convey access. It's purely to convey where the new set of results should start from. Yeah, yeah Daryl. You ha in your second query there, you have count 50. Um, does that mean that in that result, I'm going to get a new Delta token that would then allow me to retrieve those past 50? Or do I then do a skip with the same Delta token until I run out of everything in that Delta token, and then I'll get a new Delta token at a later point? Uh, having not written a draft yet and intending to get uh, feedback on approaches before doing so right now, um, haven't uh, completely, uh, I guess, ironed out that mechanic, but the there's a cursor-based pagination draft that is uh, you know, probably about to go to a working group last call, and uh, the goal would, I imagine, be to either use index or cursor-based pagination to go through the set of results, uh, and I imagine if uh, you're providing any Delta token, it would probably be the same Delta token, but uh, stating different, uh, you know, uh, pages of results in whichever pagination method is being used. So to answer, so this Delta token was provided by the server in the previous scan. Mm -hmm. So uh, if there is pagination required in this current scan, so the next, so if you see the server provides a next Delta token as a response on the last page. So that is the, so this Delta scan, a Delta token is like a query parameter which needs to be provided same, uh, same in each and every page request. And on the last page, the server will ret return a next scan token, which the client needs to save for the next run of the scan after whatever interval of time. Does yeah. that clarify? I think so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike? Yeah, I just want to add two more things that we might want to consider as you think about the draft. Uh, one is, depending on what information you bring back, it highly influences how many delta changes you're getting back. In other words, if you bring back in last login as an attribute, uh, then there's going to be a ton of delta changes and that'll impact how you approach in your best practice to doing these delta queries. Not all, furthermore, not all service providers are optimized to respond really quickly to these kinds of, of delta queries, whether a timestamp or not. And so sometimes practically full ags are actually just as fast as, as some of these filtered delta queries. So it's just an interesting thing to think through, you know, best practices and stuff as you approach it. So. Uh, yeah, thanks for your comments. So some of those, uh, I, I guess, topics we have thought about already. Uh, and I, I'd just like to clarify that uh, we're not necessarily intending to write uh, a mechanism that is uh, uh, honestly suitable for everybody uh, versus, say, just using a timestamp. Uh, for instance, uh, as, you know, even without the uh, is deleted or whichever, or just doing uh, you know a full import every so often, uh, but that there are uh, you know sort of uh, use cases uh, that uh, seem to be out there uh, 
uh, where there is a uh, desire to efficiently and uh, frequently retrieve uh, data of you know the current state of uh, a system. So you know human resources uh, systems, for example, just you know uh, I guess in the what we call it identity, uh, it's very common nowadays uh, for people wanting to connect uh, you know their true source of uh, you know truth for a lot of their user data into other systems. Uh, but even then, just you know, high value systems, which uh, you know they may be able to optimize, but maybe not. Uh, it uh, allows to keep a sort of a steadier eye on uh, the state of things and uh, helps to address any uh, unexpected or unwanted uh, changes. Uh, you know, just anything from cosmetic to uh, things that affect authorization. Pam, this one's quick. So. Uh... In the, the question that Daryl asked, so are you presuming that it has to be cursor-based pagination for this? Like, is this draft tightly coupled to the cursor pagination draft or not? Um, I have a preference, at least, of uh, for, for if the if there's a clear problem statement of uh, you know requirements of I guess high you know trustworthy accuracy and uh, efficiency and whichever to write with one approach rather than two, uh, just in uh, providing uh, more options than I, I guess we'll say uh, either absolutely necessary uh, or something to that effect uh, can lead to interoperability challenges where uh, some employers choose one, some choose the other. Uh, and if uh, you know, one of the two options doesn't actually fulfill all the needs of you know the other side of uh, some of these uh, integrations or interactions, then uh, post investment in building you know the, the one option, they will find out that it doesn't actually work and also a waste of time. But but Danny, you, there's no actual requirement, like spec wise. There's no dependency in the spec. This does not actually depend on cursor pagination, right? You could implement this with non cursor pagination. I'm sorry, I completely process what you said as a different question than what you asked. Um, that was a good answer, though. It was an answer, answer to the question that you didn't ask. Uh, <laughs> but uh, is this dependent on cursor-based pagination? Um, I would probably want it to be, at least in the scope of the problems that uh, I'm targeting in uh, you know, the uh, accuracy, reliability, all that because I, I think index-based pagination has its own problems with accuracy uh, and you know, uh, changing live uh, result sets, but so probably. Okay, well, if there's opinions, you know, if, if people have uh, different opinions, I'm sure they'll let you know. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, Mike, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I'm sure to take what Pam said. Yeah, I, I think I, I would prefer to just leave it independent um, because I think it's, it's a slightly tangential, uh, tangential problem set. I just wanted to go on the record as having saying that, that's all. It doesn't mean I'm against cursor-based pagination, by the way, Danny. It just means that uh, I see it as a tangential thing. So that's all. Yeah, I think if I step back, I, if they are... Uh, separate, and I don't think anything from a technical standpoint requires uh, cursor pagination for uh, uh, either form of like uh, you know pooling changes. Uh, just as far as targeting, uh, I guess uh, you know trustworthy result set where you haven't accidentally missed something. Uh, that would be a thing that uh, you know I would require if I was employing. But uh, I can understand that. Uh, yeah, I I, uh, uh, I get your feedback. Uh, and then, yeah, just uh, talking through some of the, I guess, uh, analysis of this. Uh, so for uh, just, uh, I guess, context, uh, I am not a software engineer. Because uh, to the best of my ability, I understand these things. Um, uh, a watermark-based approach uh, has some of the benefits of being uh, more accurate by avoiding, uh, you know, some of the time drift that can happen if uh, just explicit, you know, like, uh, get on meta last modified uh, thing exists. Uh, it also eliminates any concerns over uh, time drift uh, or time differences even between the client and the server. And it at least you know isolates down to 
uh, different systems or servers, whichever, uh, behind the like the front face of the Skim API. Uh, it also uh, ultimately provides flexibility to server implementers, uh, where even if their internal system tracks changes with a uh, timestamp and they don't have any sort of change log, uh, either directly, you know, whether or not we, uh, you know, use a should or a must or whichever uh, to describe uh, using an opaque value. Uh, they can, you know, either uh, encode it or just put it straight in, uh, as you know, in that uh, you know, uh, container of uh, you know next uh, or what was it? Uh, delta token equals X. Um, so it it's uh, I guess syntactically uh, or what protocolly would <laughs> allow for one uh, method regardless of how the implementer at least is uh, or the the same server implementer uh, was handling any sort of change detection behind the scenes. Uh, some of the limitations, it is uh, more likely uh, to be a complex solution uh, for applications, uh, especially if they don't have uh, sort of a change log already. Uh, the, uh, if the client loses uh, all recent watermark values, uh, then if uh, there's, I don't know, like a server instability, internet outage, pick whatever you want, then uh, to go back they uh, and you know re, uh, reobtain those results. Uh, they may either have to do a uh, a sort of a, a full get, or at least you know cover a lot more ground than they intended to. Uh, depends on the lifetime of the watermark, and uh, it doesn't potentially provide. Uh, if this is a you know a mutually exclusive or whatever uh, option, where uh, only the watermark is being proposed and not say uh, is deleted, also with uh, what do you call it with uh, like a timestamp then it uh, re removes some flexibility on that sort of, you know, correcting n a known bad set of data by saying, hey, give me the last two minutes, or sorry, the last uh, two days or whichever of uh, changes. Uh, uh, I do want to make sure we have time for the next yeah. presentation, so keep this quick. Yep. Uh, so this one, the materials are on uh, the data tracker. Uh, this is essentially just some open items we're seeking input on. Uh, some of that which we got here today, and we will uh, write up something and send it to the mailing list as well. Uh, anybody with experience in this, we appreciate your help in uh, figuring out how, if at all, to approach this. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right, skim events, and we got Phil. Great, can everybody hear me? Sounds great. Okay, let's go to the next slide then. Uh, so just a, a couple of changes to this spec. Most of the work uh, for me has been around implementation. Um, we had uh, to restructure the event URIs a little bit. Uh, Iana pointed out, I think it was Amanda, pointed out there is no actual event registries for security event tokens. So would we want to use the skim registry? Um, and so the new spec, uh, it may need some tweaking still, but it'll establish a new registry under the namespace uh, param skim event. So all the event names, whereas prior, I had it in a different order, assuming there was an event registry and there's not. Um, so all that is neither here or there to the actual spec other than the, the name had to change. Um, so all of that should be more or less stabilized. Um, we had a good call a couple of weeks ago on the asynchronous event because I was thinking, is it time to punt that or is it time to go with it? We had a really good uh, example from Workday and I'll cover that on the next couple of slides. Um, along with that, and you'll see why soon, I added uh, a new attribute for service provider config so that clients can discover whether asynchronous events are supported. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next slide and see what that is. So an async skim request is basically any 7644 requests, a skim protocol request. So for example, if you're doing a put and all you're doing that's different is you're putting a prefer header that says you would prefer a respond async response. 
And when you do that, you'll get the, the next slide, I believe I have it. You'll get a response that it was accepted. There are two possibilities um, for the location. The location can be the actual resource location. Uh, and optionally, it could be actually a place where you can go and check for whether the transaction is completed. Uh, so the transaction ID that you would look for corresponds to the set transaction value. So determining which response you're going to get is also part of service provider config. So that gives um, clients who are waiting for uh, a skim server whose response might take 30 minutes. Uh, they don't have to keep the HCP connection open while they're waiting. They can just say, oh, I would like an asynchronous response. And then half an hour later, they can pull and check whether that specific transaction finished. So next slide. And the event response as laid out in the spec is basically uh, the async response and the values in that response are simply the same information that you would have got had you had the normal skim response in a synchronous manner, um, except you're now getting it as a security event. Um, so the two ways that that event response can be delivered is uh, either via doing an HTTP GET, as I mentioned on the previous slide, or you're getting it through the event delivery streams that you may have configured with the service provider. So you can get it one of two ways. And that's it for the async, and that's how that works. If there's any questions, let me know. Okay. Next slide. So the discovery uh, that I mentioned before. Oh, sorry. We, we do have a question from Daryl. Go ahead, Daryl. Rambling to get on the queue. <laughs> Just a few comments. Um, if you do prefer async, it is expected you return preference applied as a response header to say that uh, the server did do the thing that you asked it to do. Uh, is that one of the defined? I can do. We can do that. I didn't know there there was a response header for I, that. I believe it says that in seventy two forty. Okay, um, we'll update the spec. Yeah, because that was a question we had on the on the call is, um, do you get a 200 response or do you get the 204 accepted? And then, you know, I'm not yeah. sure in skim protocol, because we normally return a 200, the 204 response tells you uh, that information already. But if the convention is to give uh, that it was applied, I'm open to that. We can, I'll look at that up and refine it. Thanks for the feedback. I, I noticed your location header value was quoted. That's usually location values aren't quoted. Okay, we'll fix that too. Um, and I'll 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 channel Mark here. Mark Nottingham has told we're not supposed to use the location header for this, but everybody does. So <laughs> I'll leave that with you. I, I had questions about that too. Okay, thank you. So the discovery, this was to try and help the client figure out what's going to happen. And we came up with three scenarios, uh, none which clients should assume is the case that the servers don't support async requests unless they've implemented it, or because of administrative centers, they, there, is no none, there is no async response. Um, long, and this is really the other two cases, does the server elect to go async if the request takes a certain amount of time? Like if it takes more than five seconds, it can respond asynchronously. Um, and if the, and if you want that to be a contract and to say, I don't care how long it takes, I want you to respond asynchronously for other reasons, then you can say it's on request. Um, so that was us trying to think of what are the, possibilities and we don't really want to get too complex. I want to uh, replay that against uh, the new feedback we just had on the call here uh, with the uh, prefer response um, and I'll tie that in together. 
Danny. Uh, I'm, I'm curious if you, uh, yeah, I'm ahead. curious if you've thought about uh, any, uh, I guess, you know, applications where, uh, I guess it would be a fourth async request value of always. That's what request means. If, if the client indicates that um, they prefer async response, then it okay. always responds that way. Long just simply okay. means if you request it, I may still give it back to you if I think it's fast enough. Or sorry, uh, I realized the the vague uh, or the, uh, the ambiguous part of my question. Uh, if the yeah. server would prefer to only ever respond asynchronously. That would be a change to the protocol, in my opinion. It's up to the client to use the prefer header per 7240. There's actually a new RFC for that, apparently. Okay. Um, and event URIs was simply listing this. These are the URIs, event types that the server can generate. Uh, which might mean it only supports the CRUD operations or it could support all the other events. Um, there is the question, though, of just because the server is capable of generating, it doesn't mean it's willing to generate it. So uh, we may have some more discussion there. Uh, we have a question. Uh, just a little bit of feedback. Um, that setting threshold on long, uh, we've at Microsoft have spent months, years debating what that right value is. Um, <laughs> the other interesting option is in 7240, they have a wait command, which allows the client to say how long it wants to wait before uh, returning a 202, which it <laughs> stops the service provider from having to go do it. Um, and I'll give you one of the pieces of data is we recently looked at 202 responses that we get back from our API and approximately 0.6% of clients actually bother go polling after the fact. It's a pain for developers to actually use this stuff. So if you do it, yeah, it's cool, but you'll find a lot of clients just have code that say, oh, it's a sta successful status code, it's a 2XX, and they assume it works and they move on assuming yeah. uh, that as completed and the rest of the code may work or may not work. So yeah, it's a double edged sword. I, the primary need that I heard was um, that uh, uh, the use case was that they had a lot of requests that take minutes to hours uh, and holding the HTTP connections open indefinitely was a blocker. Um, so they wanted to open up the doors. And of course, being the spec writers, we want everything definitive. And exactly your case com comments come to mind. And uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to get too ambitious and I fully expect most clients don't care. But for those, I was giving, we're giving two mechanisms. Yeah. I actually would prefer one mechanism, which would be the event stream. But if you're not implementing event streams, then the fallback is the location to go get it. Um, I think that that I, I'd love to have more discussion on that and uh, see if we can how we can improve it. All right. Okay. So, are we on the next slide? Sure. So I have. I don't know how much of it we're going to do. I have a demo. Um, We've got the i2 skim server. Um, it's uh, we're currently working on code that we're developing as we as we're going, and I was making changes this morning, so this is not not even alpha grade stuff. But I'll comment that the implementation for um, RFC 8935 and 8936, which is set push and set pull, uh, went fairly straightforward. And then we have I2 Go signals, which is a store and forward uh, system that handles uh, event streams, deals with uh, grabbing all the events and sending them to the receivers and letting you set up different deployment scenarios, whether you're having 
whether you're supporting communication between the cluster or communication between domains, uh, between different cloud providers, and you need to have a handoff point. That's the idea. Um, and it turns out that push and pull are both useful for different reasons, depending on the layout that you're dealing with. Um, the other reason I did all this work was one of the comments early on was that recovery was an important item. So one of the nice things about having this kind of service is that if it's maintaining a stream context, then it's possible to reset the stream indefinitely for, case, for cases like skim, um, but you can also have streams uh, only uh, retain information for an hour uh, because you might have a high rate of exchange because uh, security streams are gonna be used for many, many different things. So a lot of the standardization for how that works is actually being done by the OpenID shared signals group. And they're sort of defining how those servers should operate from a management perspective. But what we've got here today is just 8935 and 8936 working with skim servers and, and a store and forward system called GoSignals. Uh, next slide. So what I actually have today, I didn't, this slide is a little too ambitious. I have skim server one and it's sending events to skim server 1B and back and forth. So they're, they're essentially replicas of each other. And the idea is I can put events to either side or skim transactions to either side and an event flows through go signals one and gets sent to the other server. And just to make sure we're doing things right, it actually, GoSignals1 will send it back to the originating server um, as a closed loop and the originating server will reject it as a duplicate transaction because it of course published the transaction to begin with. Um, I've also got a polling monitor on GoSignals2, so a copy of the event now goes to GoSignals2, which would represent, for example, um, uh, could be uh, Workday passing events back to Azure and the Azure servers getting a feed of the events and then they can decide what to do with it, uh, which may be to send it to another skim server uh, or just, just process it in another event processor that decides what to do. So I'll share the desktop. Um, Pam has a question. Oh. Go, go ahead. Oh, Pam said she'll wait. Go ahead and do the demo, Phil. We're not seeing your screen. Is it? Is it going? I'm just trying to understand this tool. Oh, it's going to do this. Probably going to ask uh, for permissions. Yeah, try and share something and then we'll approve it. I did already. He, I approved oh. it, but it's not. There it is. Okay. <laughs> See it. Uh, okay. So you. S so what I have is a, a Go Signals demo. There is a database cluster that that actually the two Go servers talk to. Um, they each have a different uh, database that they're using. I'll show you that in a minute. So Go Signals 1 receives events. You can see that prior to this demo, it received an event uh, from one of the skim servers, which was to create an entry uh, for myself. And then it checks the other event streams that are out there and sent those events on to the other partners, one of which was GoSignals2, which then received the event and passed it on to my administrative client, which I'll now turn on here. So this is running off of GoSignals2. Oh. 
And I'm going to update. Let's see. First of all, let's pull my record. Make sure I have the current ID because I've run this a few times. So. So I'm going to run this. I have a skim server running on port 9000 and another one on 9001. So we'll run this put. And if I go over to Docker, we can see so skim cluster one received that request and it generated a token here. And if I put that in Jot, it'll show you the modification, but just to speed things up. Skim cluster two. Received the event. It's doing polling now to get the event from the server. And it acknowledged that it received it. So over here, remember I left this running as a polar and it also received the event and it saw the, th the three changes and one of it was to change the profile URL to i2skim.io. So this is after three hops away, I'm now in a separate domain. I've been received notice of the change and I can act on that change immediately. Uh, if we look at the database, just to give you an idea of what streams are like. So Go Signals 2 has received copies of the events. So this was the original event. Which created created the entry and this was the update event. There's the put. And then I actually break out for sorting reasons. So you can pull out the event. One of the things that happens is that when an event gets received, um, the router goes through and looks at the streams that are defined. And I have a bunch of streams defined and decides which which stream should get what event and keeps track of it uh, by putting in pending event. If the event hasn't been delivered, it sits in pending. And then once it's delivered, we have the list of events that have been processed, um, which gives the, the event number and the acknowledgement date so you can track what's there. What that lets me do then is if somebody needs to have uh, their event stream reset because their database crashed or whatever, you can go back to this polling provider and reset the stream. Uh, and basically we're just rebuilding it from the events database and we can rebuild the pending events for that stream. So all of that's there. Uh, sorry, I don't have a jazzy demo. Uh, let me try one more thing. We only have like a minute left, Pam, do you want to? Jump yeah. In and ask your question. Yeah. Why don't we take questions? Hi, this is Pam Dingle. I'm sorry I didn't raise my hand in the app. Um, so in this case, it actually really matters that the client follows, does check back for the async request, right? If the async request, if this thing starts with an async create, and you send the skim event that propagates based on the assumption that it's going to return, but it, does, but it actually fails 30 minutes later, then you could actually get into a circumstance where, uh, where some of the clients think that this, the request has succeeded and others think it's failed, right? Because some of them received an event from a client that didn't bother to check back and some of them received an event from a client that did bother to check back, right? Is that? Uh, so there. I think we're talking, we might be talking about slightly different scenarios. So the async request starts with a normal skim operation. 
and they request uh, they requested an async completion. What I did with uh, Putty was simply a straightforward uh, skim request, and we immediately got back that it was created, right? And what happened in the background was because I sent it to the skim server on port 9001, we want to make sure that the other replica is updated. So what's happening is the async stream system is taking care of replication by pushing that event directly to port 9000. It consumes the event uh, itself. So that's all done in the background asynchronously without the client having to worry. So in this case, the client confirmed with the server it sent the request to and got a response saying, yes, that request was captured and was successful. And then in the background, all the other copies got synchronized. And also my command line client also got a copy of that event because that's what I've set it up to do. Um, now the problem, so now let's say this is a possibility. So say, say you're a company based on LDAP you've received that event, it's a skim event, but you want to take that piece of information and translate it into your own processor and decide what commands you're going to play on your side. So you can do that. Um, and then you can go back. If you find that you, uh, the system that was processing it failed somehow, you can still recover the event and go get, get the old events back. The great thing is the skim servers are up to date. They don't have to keep track of uh, cursors and paging indexes. They just publish the event. It's no different publishing an event than, say, doing logging, because uh, the, the, the server just pushes out the event like the same way it would log, and it's done, and it's gone into uh, the signals service. And it doesn't have to be Go signals. It could be any shared signals framework server implementation. So I'm doing a lot of work right now to make sure that SSF is fully capable of dealing with uh, skim events in this way. So they're doing a lot of work on that and uh, pretty pretty happy with the OpenID work on this. Thanks, thanks, Phil. We are over time. We have to uh, close yep. this up, but thank you all uh, and See you. Oh, one quick note: side meeting for the skim is tomorrow. So if you, it's on the wiki uh, tomorrow. Have an unofficial side meeting for chatting about any of this stuff that we want to talk about. Uh, that is in eleven thirty in the morning at. I don't remember the room. It's on the wiki. One of the side meeting rooms. Yeah. Okay. We're we, we're 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 out. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I'm uh, working on uh, interoperable state synchronization and looking to do a, a, a BOF or dispatch a working group next IETF. I'm interested. There's a lot of state synchronization here. If you're interested in talking to me afterwards, um, I just love to share. Yeah. Hopefully, see you at the side meeting. Cool. Thanks, everyone. So I'm trying to see. I'm trying to cancel. Oh, okay. Well, I'll be there. I have a really boring question for you.